Uh, well, it's my pleasure to present our work in progress uh, related to pollen forecasting. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to uh, give you a little sense of um, the work we've been doing for Haycast and some of the potential public health implications. Uh, go through some of our approaches to uh, obtaining data for developing forecasts and uh, then talk about some of the potential applications. I'd like to highlight that I have some uh, disclosures to make, uh, some funding from several different uh, federal agencies and some sponsored travel, uh, none of which uh, from my point of view affects my perspective on this work, but I do like to make sure everybody knows uh, where I get my funding from. I also uh, want to highlight that this work would not be possible, of course, without HACAS funding, but also without the generous support uh, in terms of data from all of these allergists and uh, pollenologists who are part of the National Allergy Bureau uh, network and contribute their pollen observations and data free of charge for use with research. And uh, it's been a uh, fundamental resource for our work and we're really grateful for uh, their contribution. So as I mentioned, I'm gonna highlight uh, the public health implications of uh, pollen exposure. Talk a little bit about what allergies are, uh, what their epidemiology is uh, for the places where we have good data. Um, as a background to thinking about how we can better manage uh, allergic disease and the role of forecasting specifically in managing aller allergic disease related to pollen. And then highlight uh, some of the work we've done on forecasts, all of which is work in process, or excuse me, work in progress. Um, but we've made a lot of progress over the past several years and uh, we're excited to shout about it. So. Uh, <clears throat> without further ado, let's talk a little bit about the etiology and epidemiology of pollen allergies. So pollen allergies uh, are pretty widespread. It appears to be something of a modern disease. Uh, we see it much more commonly in um, high-income countries, and the prevalence of allergies has been increasing pretty substantially over the last several decades. Um, we know that there's a substantial global burden of disease, but we really only have great statistics for uh, high income countries, particularly the US and Europe. Uh, we know that allergic rhinitis and allergic asthma are the two main forms of allergic disease related to pollen. There are obviously a lot of other allergic uh, diseases out there that uh, impose quite a bit of morbidity and mortality uh, globally. But for pollen exposure specifically, we're particularly concerned about allergic rhinitis or hay fever and then allergic asthma. Um, <clears throat> and allergic rhinitis is the more common of the two. Uh, we have uh, prevalence, uh, sort of point in time estimates of between 10 and 30% of the population suffers from allergic rhinitis in high income countries and then allergic asthma smaller, uh, but not in substantial proportion, about five to 10% of the population. And you can see some of the most recent numbers here. The highlight is that allergic rhinitis generally doesn't kill people, uh, but it imposes a really substantial burden of disease in terms of taking people out of the workforce and taking a lot of school. There's a lot of misery associated with pollen exposure, as I'm sure those of you who are uh, on the line who have allergies can appreciate. Uh, and probably most of you have been going through uh, hay fever season recently and uh, like me, uh, been exposed to pollen and been suffering the consequences. Uh, allergic asthma is uh, fortunately a lot less common, but uh, considerably more dangerous. And uh, there are some fatalities associated with severe asthma exacerbations. They're very frightening to people who experience them. Um, they thankfully don't contribute that much to the overall total uh, disease burden because most of that is uh, related to allergic rhinitis. Overall, as you can see here, this is quite an expensive disease. Uh, this is direct medical costs, indirect medical costs, and then indirect costs associated with 
absenteeism and presenteeism, as mentioned. Uh, this is an immune disease. It's a disease of immune derangement. And so people develop this disease from pollen exposure early in their lives. Uh, there are probably other exposures that contribute, likely air pollution, actually, uh, though we don't know as much about that as we'd like. Uh, there are also other, the absence of certain exposures that immune uh, modulate, like exposure to large um, domesticated farm animals, actually uh, appears to be part of the issue as well and uh, drives the high rates of uh, allergic disease that we see in uh, middle and high income countries as they transition away from kind of a rural uh, farm oriented existence. Uh, we see an increase in uh, immune dysregulation that contributes to allergic disease. Um, there are a whole bunch of different things you can do to manage your allergic disease, starting from avoiding the exposure by staying inside in an uh, environment where the air is filtered, um, to taking different kinds of medications. And I'm going to go into that a little bit more later because it's important to think about uh, management strategies. One of the things that uh, we do know about allergic rhinitis is that local exposure as a child to particular flora seems to drive specific allergies. So you can see here uh, from a cohort in the Great Basin that as people are exposed to uh, prevalent pollens in the region, they develop sensitization uh, to those specific plants. And you can see here, these are uh, two different versions of pollen calendars um, that uh, allergies have a season. And those seasons depend on the type of plant we're talking about. So for trees, generally starts uh, late winter, goes through late spring into early summer. Uh, for grass, it's summer. And then weeds tends to be summer into uh, early fall. And you can see from the image on the left that there's a pretty broad season, and then there's a period of intense exposure. And that broad season accounts for differences uh, by geography, and then also uh, the fact that pollen exposure tends to ramp up, uh, in some cases, quite dramatically over several days, and you have an intense period. But there's a, quite a range here. If you're thinking about you know, a patient is going to see an allergist and thinking about how they would uh, time their medication so that they can manage their symptoms best, these pollen calendars are a little imprecise. They give you a general sense of when you might need to think about it, um, but probably don't refine your own personal experience that much, uh, or refine on your personal experience that much in terms of managing your allergies. Um, <clears throat> so we have, as part of this work, uh, tried to get a better handle on how uh, allergies impact people's health in the United States. We've also tried to get a sense of what uh, weather and other factors are driving the exposures that we see causing those health impacts. Uh, we have colleagues at the CDC with whom we did some retrospective analyses related to uh, pollen exposure for weeds, trees, and grass pollen, and then looked at several different measures of morbidity. Um, we set our exposure levels at pretty low levels, 50 grains per meter cubed. Um, and uh, that's quite a low count compared to the high counts you see sometimes in you know, peak exposure season. Um, and we linked it to a database of uh, claims from um, Truven Market Scan, controlled for several other factors that we thought were important to consider, and uh, elevated and looked at uh, elevated relative risk for these different outcomes. And, I'm not going to dwell on these results, but I want to highlight to you that if you look overall at trees, grass, and weeds, what you see is that trees seem to be the most problematic exposure uh, in the cities that we examined. And we see a relative risk on high pollen days of uh, prescription medication refills that roughly about 20 to 30 percent over the baseline. If you look at trees specifically, and you look at kids who we know are the most sensitive, you see a more substantial relationship. So roughly a 50% increase on high tree pollen days. Um, so we know that trees and kids are probably the populations, uh, the exposures in the populations that we're particularly interested in here. Part of our motivation for this work is that uh, allergies are increasingly common, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and that 
of course, is multifactorial. It has to do with development patterns and other things. And it also probably has to do with increasing exposure. And part of the reason for that increasing exposure is related to warming. So here in the United States, you can see that um, as the climate has changed, we've seen shifts in plant hardiness. So basically the entire country is warming, warming uh, more quickly in the north. And so plant hardiness zones are shifting. This is actually a relatively old uh, comparison from 1990 to 2006. We've seen substantial warming since then. So this trend has continued and, and accelerated slightly. And that warming means that uh, two things. One is that a lot of habitats are more suitable to allergenic plants. So looking at current tree habitat distribution for allergenic trees, you can see that uh, parts of the Midwest are uh, particularly highly exposed. But going forward toward the end of the century with a high emission scenario, we are likely to see much more widespread high uh, exposures to highly allergenic trees. So we wanted to get some handle on how these relationships might play out so that we could project this risk and help people think through how to manage it going forward. Another issue related uh, to increased pollen has to do with carbon dioxide. So ambient carbon dioxide levels drive plant growth and that drives uh, pollen formation and we think maybe also pollen allergenicity. So here with ragweed, you can see that there's been an increase in the season duration, which is principally related to warming or actually a later frost date. Uh, but there's probably also a contribution from uh, increased ambient CO2 levels that's driving some of this as well. And we expect to see this relationship accelerate going forward as uh, we see higher levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So over time, we don't have a lot of data looking at cohorts and their sensitization to pollen, uh, but this cohort from Korea saw a, a clear increase in sensitization to pollens as exposure went up. And again, we would expect this to be sensitization to local flora. Um, so what we know overall from the epidemiology is that there's a pretty substantial widespread significant disease burden. It's almost all morbidity, uh, but it's really it, quite significant and costly uh, that we know that it's increasing along with socioeconomic development. So as many places move from low to middle to high income status, and they move away from those protective immune uh, modulating exposures, we are likely to see much more widespread pollen allergies throughout the world, um, not just in the current high income countries where it's really prevalent. Uh, we know that pollen exposure is a strong driver of incidence and that we expect pollen exposure to go up substantially as uh, over the next several decades as a result of uh, warming and increases in ambient CO2. So long story short, there are a lot of reasons to worry about pollen currently, and there are a lot of reasons to think about how uh, climate change and other changes in socioeconomic development may push uh, exposure up and the prevalence up substantially in the next several decades. So what do we do about it? Well. This woman is exhibiting probably a whole bunch of behaviors that are uh, pretty maladaptive. That mask is not going to really help with a lot of uh, these pollens. And she's sitting there tugging on a branch, liberating a bunch of grains. And I don't know what she's doing with that blister pack, but hopefully she's going to take some of that medicine sometime soon. Uh, we basically have three options for allergic disease management. Medication, as I mentioned, there are various uh, types of antihistamine formulations and other medications, uh, inhaled steroids, that are pretty effective at uh, reducing allergy symptoms. Uh, these medications often need to be started in advance of the pollen season. Uh, some of them work, you know, over hours, uh, but particularly the steroids are more effective over several days. So a little bit of advance warning is helpful for calibrating medication use uh, and managing it so you don't over-medicate uh, when you don't need to. Of course, exposure reduction is a mainstay, so you want to know uh, when you're going to have particularly high days because there's a clear dose-response relationship between pollen exposure and symptoms. And then for people who are very highly exposed, there are some immune therapy uh, options that are quite effective. They are oddly enough, not at all 
timed with pollen exposure. There's no relationship between when you should start your immune therapy and when you are likely to be exposed uh, to a particular pollen season. So immune therapy and uh, timing in terms of forecasting pollen is actually not that helpful. That is uh, reserved, therapy is reserved for a subset of people. Uh, most people are in the mild to moderate category in terms of their allergies, and they'll be relying heavily on uh, medication and exposure reduction as their strategies for reducing disease. And we know from sensitized patients that people who have uh, tree pollen allergies and are exposed to pollen are likely to seek care. They go to hospital in this case. This is another uh, cohort from Asia and that there's clearly a relationship with temperature. There are some uh, phenological associations between high pollen counts and weather variables that are quite intriguing and have led people to focus on ways to forecast pollen and help avoid exposure principally um, historically. And as, you, as I mentioned before, uh, we have some general sense of when these uh, aeroallergens are prevalent, but these pollen calendars are based on historical pollen seasons. And as mentioned, they're, they're quite broad. So having some more specific localized information really probably could help people manage their symptoms more effectively. Of course, we have some um, for-profit uh, companies out there that are providing pollen allergy forecasts currently. They don't make their information available, so it's hard to evaluate the effectiveness of their forecasting. Uh, they forecast based on categories, low, medium, high, and um, as well as we know about their algorithm, it basically uh, looks at historical counts. Uh, it's not clear how well these, um, these forecasts correlate with observations currently or whether they're updated to account for uh, more uh, recent patterns in terms of uh, aeroallergen emissions. So we felt like it was important to try and develop our own approach to this and uh, be transparent about the uh, models that we're using. We, as I mentioned, are using uh, data from the National Allergy Bureau, uh, which we're very grateful for. That data is uh, unique in the United States. Um, we've received data for uh, about 45 to 50 stations total. Um, and the number of stations for which we have a pretty good time series are uh, outlined on that map there. Uh, the other two images highlight some issues with the data. Uh, I wanna highlight that these, these data are collected by allergists and allergy clinics at their own expense. Uh, they purchase the collectors, they pay for staff to go get trained in how to identify pollens, and then they pay for the staff to do the collection, identification, and post the results, uh, and they share that data free of charge. And so there are some, there's a little bit of latitude in terms of uh, what when they are allowed to collect. Most of them don't collect over the weekend. Some of them don't collect entire year round because there uh, aren't pollens of interest at certain points in the year. So the data has a little bit of, um, it has some holes in it and some places have more holes than others. Uh, you can see here from Silver Spring, this time series has a number of breaks in it that mostly correspond to the weekends. Uh, and you can see here, this uh, time series from uh, London, Ontario shows uh, holes in data from roughly 2008 to 2017 in the early spring. And I mentioned this just to note, not to be critical of the data collectors, but more to highlight that there are some data considerations um, that complicate our modeling, particularly for uh, start dates, because sometimes people aren't collecting data. They've been collecting data based on historical pollen seasons. And as uh, pollen seasons have shifted over time, they haven't necessarily changed their collection practices. So sometimes we have some uh, sparsity in the data, particularly earlier on in the season. So one of our first tasks in this work was just to do pretty extensive descriptive analyses of uh, the pollen data that we had available to us and uh, to generate new updated pollen calendars. And so you just, this is a, a heat map of pollen exposure um, in all of these different cities in our entire data set. So this is all uh, aero, 
significant arrow allergens in our data set, and you can see clearly the pollen season for the most uh, southern stations uh, is essentially year round, uh, you know, starts in mid December and then continues on through May. There's a little drop in the summer when it's really too hot for some of those plants to be emitting. Um, and the start of the season up to Coeur d'Alene, Idaho starts, you know, in uh, kind of around March. Uh, so you've got quite a bit of variability based on geography, and you've got two peaks, uh, particularly you've got uh, the trees in the beginning here in the spring, you've got some grass pollen that's persistent through the summer, and then you've got that weed peak later in the year. And we've developed pollen calendars that are updated based on our uh, sample for all of these different uh, taxa listed here, and for uh, grasses and weeds, and <clears throat> um, you can see the patterns they're pretty clearly distinct uh, across the three different groups. And allergists tend to think about exposure in terms of those three main categories. So we've done a lot of our work to correlate with how they think clinically about uh, these exposures. We've also developed pollen calendars that are site specific. Uh, so here you see for Seattle, uh, we have pretty high pollen exposure right about now. Uh, and those of us up here in the Pacific Northwest have been feeling that lately. Uh, and those of us who grew up in the Pacific Northwest, which is not me, uh, but some of my colleagues, including Fiona Lowe, our graduate student who's done many of these analyses, uh, are very likely to be allergic to cypress because that's the uh, prevalent exposure here, and then also to alder. We know that when we look at associations with weather, that there's a very clear association between start date and geography. So latitude, which is kind of a proxy for climate, there's also a very clear association, as you can see outlined here, between the start date, geography, and the duration of the pollen season. And that relationship holds no matter what the geography, and in many cases, no matter the type of pollen as well. So how does this all bundle up into forecasting issues? Uh, we have fairly skilled forecasts currently. They may well serve their purpose adequately for some populations. We would like to uh, make them more precise. We'd like to update them with uh, more recent weather and climate information. And we'd really like to generate some models that produce skilled forecasts for parts of the world where we don't currently have information about uh, pollen exposure historically. So we want to develop models that work for all three major types of uh, allergenic plants and for each of these specific taxa. We want to work across a wide range of geographies, including starting with the continental United States, but expanding eventually to uh, other regions. We want to generate a forecast that's pretty skilled at least a week in advance so people can make appropriate decisions about when to start and stop medications. Uh, we want to capture really high counts so people know uh, when to uh, invest in avoiding exposure on particularly high days so that they can, uh, you know, gain the um, or reduce their symptoms when uh, their exposure is likely to be really high. Uh, and then we want to look at, for ragweed, the season end, because ragweed is a, is a bit of a different beast. The photo period is, is what drives uh, when ragweed um, pollinates and ragweed season uh, ends at the first freeze. And so if you can capture those dynamics, you're better able to capture when the ragweed season is likely to end. And we ultimately, our goal is to accurately support the decisions that patients and allergists are trying to make to reduce the disease burden. I wanna show you an image here of uh, a tree outside of our atmospheric science building on the University of Washington campus last year, uh, emitting pollen on a warm for us, 75 degree, very dry day with really high winds. And you can see here that weather variables really strongly impact pollen release when plants are ready to release it. Uh, so we want definitely to capture in our model uh, weather data of these sort at a, at a fairly granular level in order to capture uh, factors that drive pollen exposure in the hour to day timeframe. We also are interested in several other factors that we know relate to pollen exposure more broadly. Those include meteorology and climate, 
uh, vegetation indices, geography, and pollen levels uh, historically, including pollination from other taxa, which may be temporally related to releases of taxa of interest. You can see, luckily, that we have some help from NASA in terms of uh, global coverage of several variables that are really important here in terms of temperature and uh, vegetation. These are images from MODIS and Landsat that show uh, land surface temperature and uh, vegetation indices, which are a measure of green up, and we have several different measures of green up that we incorporate into our models. Uh, green up is a, you would think that green up would be very helpful for forecasting pollen, and it turns out it's really helpful for certain kinds of pollen, particularly deciduous trees, but for other kinds of pollen related to weeds, related to non-deciduous trees and related to grasses, it's not as much of a helpful driver, but those indices nevertheless are, are important parts of our model. So we have gone through several different strategies for modeling pollen. We uh, settled in on a machine learning random forest decision tree approach, because that is the most highly skilled. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with those, these are models that uh, put together an ensemble of decision trees, a complicated set of decision trees to build predictive models. Uh, they're very computationally efficient, which is helpful. They are great at capturing nonlinear and complex uh, relationships and dynamics. And you can use them for a really wide range of applications. And they don't tend to overfit uh, too badly, which can be a problem with some of the other uh, regression-oriented approaches that we tried. So you can see here for uh, predicting rainfall, you categorize different aspects of uh, the variables of interest, and then you create the decision trees, and uh, you can modify these, but also the machine learning algorithm can help you identify particular strategies. And that's very useful for when we think about how to approach this complex data set that we have, which uh, as mentioned, has a lot of different issues related to our dependent variable of pollen um, and a lot of noise and a very large uh, geographic area with a lot of variability in terms of all those uh, meteorological and other variables of interest. Because of the data issues in our data set, we chose four locations to uh, zoom in on particular pollens of interest. We chose Atlanta and oak. Uh, oak is very prevalent there, There's several different species, about 30 to 40% of the pollen in Atlanta is from oak. And uh, it's a, a very good data set as are all those for uh, these different stations. We chose Kansas City for their ragweed data, uh, which is very strong. Flower Mound, Texas for cedar, and then Eugene for their uh, observations on grass. I wanna highlight here, these are uh, historical observations and then performance of our random forest machine learning model. And what you can see is that historically, the observations uh, in the year 2017, we have them for multiple other years, uh, are in blue. And then our predictions uh, with <clears throat> seven-day averages of pollen observations in the period before the prediction was made and uh, with and without regional weather data are included. And so pollen observations, if you just had pollen observations from the previous year, they would perform uh, reasonably as a forecast uh, basis, but including weather and meteorology definitely gives you a better uh, model for identifying the start date and uh, including regional meteorology in, in, uh, improves that forecast substantially. We don't capture with our model the really high peaks, but we capture uh, peaks of clinical relevance. So anything, you know, over a couple hundred grains, we are capturing with high fidelity. Uh, and it doesn't really matter probably whether it's 1,000 or 2,000 grains in terms of exposure, people are really suffering when they're up in those levels. Looking at Kansas City, same year, this is for ragweed, and you can see 
uh, a little bit more missing data, but uh, if you interpolate, uh, you can get a model that also does pretty well uh, capturing those peak periods. Um, and again, incorporating the regional weather data is uh, quite important for forecasting ragweed. For cedar, uh, again, a very uh, variable uh, historical data set, but we're able to capture it particularly well, again, with regional data as noted. And then lastly, for grasses uh, in Eugene, um, the regional data doesn't add quite as much in this case. Uh, we're still exploring whether that is a regional phenomenon or if that is true for all grasses, uh, so we have to expand our analyses to other locations and hopefully have some insight around uh, the utility of including regional data and how much regional weather and other data to include uh, to make these forecasts perform well. Um, you can see for all of these sites, this is a, a different way of presenting some of the same information, but across the x-axis here is the forecast horizon. So basically, uh, this is how many days in advance the forecast uh, is made. And then the different lines tell you whether uh, P0 means uh, recent pollen data was not included. P7 means there's a running average mean of pollen observations up to that point when the forecast is made. And then the P0 reach uh, variable is including regional data uh, in the two different forecasts, the one made without any pollen information whatsoever and the one made with pollen information. And the reason we look at uh, forecast without any pollen information is because, as you noted, there are really only a few places in the United States that actually collect pollen data, and they don't all collect it. Uh, they haven't collected it for many years necessarily, so you don't have a continuous time series of pollen data for most parts of the United States. And we have done some work that I didn't present here looking at uh, Google web searches and seeing whether those can be proxies for pollen exposure, and they actually probably can for some places where we don't have good uh, historical information, and that may increase the fidelity of our uh, forecasts uh, further. But we wanted to see what it was like if we didn't include any information about pollen at all and just use the information available to us from uh, remote satellite observations. And we actually are able to do uh, reasonably well without any uh, pollen information uh, in our two-week forecasts. This is a, a set of what are called confusion matrices. They basically are a, a way of depicting accuracy. And what you can see is our, ac our forecasts are quite strong, actually. They're a, a significant improvement all over prior uh, forecast models that have published accuracy data. Um, they are very strong uh, one day out, but they are actually pretty defensible uh, three days out. And if you look at a 14-day forecast, we do have some error of about um, uh, mean absolute, excuse me, there's a typo there, uh, mean absolute error of 4.7 days for a 14-day forecast for the season start date. But that's an improvement of about 100% on the most recent uh, other models that have been published. So we've been able to uh, do a much better job than um, the regression-based models that have been published previously. Uh, we are still working to develop models of uh, pollen exposure for areas without observations, but here is an example, if I can get it to run, of uh, oak pollen modeled projections. Um, actually, they're technically hindcast for 2009. Um, for oak based on the model we have available. And as we are refining further, getting a better sense of how much regional information to include, uh, our predictions are getting better and better. But already you can see that we, we are, are able to capture the pollen season in quite a bit of detail as it marches forward uh, for all of these different locations. And our goal by the end of the HACAST project is to produce images like these and uh, associated gridded data sets for uh, the 11 different taxa that we're looking at um, for the continental United States. We uh, will be refining those models as we move forward and then publishing that data, um, hopefully sometime this summer. 
Uh, as mentioned, we're also looking to develop regional models. So taking the information that we've developed here and moving it to other parts of the world, uh, hopefully including Canada and Europe, because we have some uh, pollen data with uh, partners from those locations. And then eventually we should be able to produce estimates in regions where there are no observations, uh, just based on uh, plant maps and other information about uh, what's on the ground. And we also should be able to produce uh, gridded exposure estimates that are hindcasted. So uh, epidemiologists can use that information to generate estimates of health impacts associated with pollen exposure historically. We also are interested in uh, producing climate change projections where we'll bring in um, climate model output for temperature, precip, and all those other weather variables that are in our model and project uh, future pollen exposure going forward. Uh, we'd like to link all of this with the health damage functions that we developed with our CDC partners. And uh, we also want to evaluate what happens when we bring in weather forecast data and see how much more skill that might add to the forecast that we are developing for pollen. And then, of course, we want to bring all of these forecast products online and make them available to different channels uh, so people can uh, start managing their allergic disease more effectively. So I thank you for your time and attention. I appreciate the opportunity to present all of this work to you and look forward to uh, answering your questions. Thanks.